got Bo Pearson here. He's from Bolt Athletics. He's a strength coach consultant at Bolt. Uh, he's got an extensive background in, in sport performance and team operations. He's consulted with over a thousand high schools, coaches, professional teams worldwide. He leads customer success and coach education at Bolt and is an athletic performance coach at Force 10 Performance. He's a certified strength and conditioning special, specialist and tactical strength and conditioning facilitator through National Strength and Conditioning Association. So lots of accolades. He's a man you can trust. <laughs> he knows what he's talking about when it comes to training. And he's going to give a little bit of that, uh, that insight on to, to all of you and to all the people that will be watching this in the future as well to the recording. So, Bo, without further ado, uh, go ahead and take things away and we'll, uh, we'll get things moving. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, I've heard it said before, never trust the man who says trust me. So thanks for saying that for me. Um, all right, let's go ahead and, and get this thing rolling. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Thank you to everybody who's watching and who will be watching uh, if, this, if you're watching it pre-recorded. But okay, so depending on where you are in the country or in the world right now, um, your situation with COVID-19 and return to sport is going to vary. Some of us are returning to campuses, we're returning to fields and weight rooms, and some of us are still completely, completely remote, and it's going to be that way for several months. You know, it's kind of undetermined how long it'll be that way. Um, but regardless of where you're at right now or what happens in the future, my goal for this talk, this presentation, is to help equip you with some strategies, equip you with some ideas for how to really optimize your training, help provide your athletes with guidance through these challenging times. And so I'm gonna share my, my ideas, the Volt's ideas, the ideas that I hear from coaches day to day as I'm talking on the phone. I'm gonna try and share as much of that relevant information with you as possible so that you can navigate this and, and help your athletes navigate it on their own as well. Uh, Jamie gave me uh, a, a, an extensive introduction, so I appreciate that. Uh, again, I'm a customer education manager is, is my, real, my official title here at Volt. What that means is I work with coaches and athletes uh, within the realms of high school and college and professional sport, also within tactical spaces of military, law enforcement, fire. Um, I work with a lot of those coaches who oversee training and actually implement Volt with their athletes or professionals. And so uh, a lot of the information that I share with you today, they might not be my own ideas. They might be ideas that I've gotten from other coaches that have worked for them. And so I'm going to try and share a lot of that with you. Um, I have 500 teams. It's probably, it's probably up to a thousand, uh, like Jamie shared in, in the five years that I've been working with Bolt, uh, working with a lot of different teams, a lot of different settings. So hopefully I can pass that information on. And just a little bit of background about Volt. I won't talk about Volt a whole lot during this conversation. I will share some ideas on how we help coaches think about different problems, but just as just to give a little bit more credibility and, and background on who we are as a company, um, our mission is very simple. We want to give everybody access to quality training, whether you are an athlete or you are a, um, a tactical professional, or you're just somebody who wants to train and wants to improve their fitness. There's a lot of misinformation out there. And so our aim is to give quality training, make it accessible to everyone, um, regardless of your background, your socioeconomic status, your geographical location, whether you're at a small school or a large school, uh, we want to give expert and research backed training to whoever needs it. So that's what, that's what we aim to do. And that's what we do every single day with our online um, and mobile technology. So let's, let's uh, jump into today's topic, optimizing at home training during COVID-19. Something I'm talking with coaches about every single day, all week long <laughs> right now. Um, I've broken up this talk into four different sections. So first we're going to talk about 10 questions to clear the path. And really this is just a goal setting or target setting or development cycle planning strategy that's really helpful in this specific scenario uh, with COVID-19 and, and the amount of uncertainty that, that exists. But also this is a framework that I believe coaches can implement and athletes can implement whenever they're trying to plan for uh, their athletic endeavors or their, their milestones that they're shooting for. So I'm going to try and lay out this framework of 10 questions that'll help people think through their processes and institute a, uh, an effective plan. Number two, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about expectation setting on behalf of the coach and why keeping it real is the best strategy. 
And this will be a little bit shorter section. I won't dive in too far with this, but um, there's just a lot, of, a lot of learnings that I've taken away in helping coaches form their strategies and set expectations that I'd like to share with you so that you can do it effectively as well. Number three, we're gonna talk about more specifically at home program design. What does it mean to put together a development program if athletes are gonna be in a confined space or have access to limited resources? And then number four, we're going to dive into return to sport. Eventually, all of this, eventually we're going to get back to sport, right? This isn't going to be forever. There might be nuances um, that, that change how we do things in the future, but eventually we're going to get back to sport and we're going to get back to competition and training. And so when that happens, we need to make sure we can do that safely. We know that the beginning of any sport season is when athletes are at a very high risk of injury. Um, because they may or may not have put the time in before the season to prepare themselves physically. They might, might not have had enough time to do so. So there are some strategies that we can implement based on research um, and, and, and ways of doing that practically to help our athletes stay safe and prepare them to, to perform at a high level. Before, oh, and, and uh, this is always helpful for me as a viewer. I like to know where we're at in the, in the presentation at all times. I'm gonna try and keep this under an hour. But there's 54 slides. I've got a little, you know, slide counter here at the bottom right. So uh, if you ever need to, you know, if you're ever wondering how far we are in the presentation, you need a quick time check or a slide check, it's right there. Okay, I'll try and get everything done within that hour, maybe even give you some time back if I can. So before we dive into those topics, a quick shout out and uh, a quick shout out to Football Canada. Uh, Jamie and his team over there is doing an awesome job of helping provide a ton of helpful resources. And one resource that I want to call out specifically is their ebook. Um, and this presentation will be, I don't know if the presentation specifically, the slides will be available. I know, I definitely know the recording is going to be available after this live event. So if you haven't already, I recommend punching this, uh, punching this link into your search bar and checking out that ebook for everything from public health guidelines to resources like emergency action plan uh, tooling that you can implement into your setting, uh, a COVID-19 assessment tool that you can literally just use, <laughs> uh, super helpful there. And then some resources and frameworks for how um, Football Canada is really defining return to play and uh, thinking about a strategy for returning people safely with the different stages and how they define those stages. So again, I recommend checking that out if you haven't already, and it's, it's gonna be super useful as you think through and, uh, and navigate uh, all, of, all of these scenarios. Hey, thank you very much, Bo. If I could just quickly chime in. First of all, thank yeah. you very much for uh, shouting out Football Canada. Uh, we've been really busy with uh, uh, return to football and making sure that everyone can return to football safe across the country. Just uh, real quick is that the presentation will be available afterwards, as well as the slides and everything uh, will be available on social media and through our website uh, later in the week. So thank you. All right, thanks. All right, we can get started with our 10 questions to clear the path. And again, there's a lot of uncertainty right now. There's a lot that we can't plan for. There's a lot we don't know in terms of timelines, especially depending on where you are um, in the world. And the, I, I included a little quote here, ambiguity is the enemy of accuracy. If you don't know what your target is, or if that target is constantly moving and it's, and it's unclear, you're a lot less likely to achieve success. So how do, we, how do we control the things that we can control? How do we aim for a target based on the information we have access to and set ourselves up for the most likely chance of success? And that's what I aim to do here with uh, pre presenting these 10 questions. Again, this is something that you can think about as a coach as you're forming your plan and also something you can recommend to your athletes to help them think about their own plan for their own development. And so number one is, where do I need to be next season? What kind of picture do I need to paint? What, what's it going to look like when I get to my next season, whether that's six weeks or six months from now? Where do I feel like I need to be to be my best? Um, what are the physical attributes I need to possess? What are the mental, how, how mentally skilled do I need to become? Um, does my body composition need to change in, from, a, from a development standpoint? Um, let's just get a really good picture and try and describe as clearly as you can of what that looks like at, when you are at your best at the start of next season. And it can be a bullet point list. It can be long form, whatever it is. Let's just try and get a really clear picture there. Again, the clearer the target, the more likely you are uh, at achieving it. 
Number two is where am I at now? Okay, where are my strengths and where are my weaknesses? Where are those gaps? And, and we don't need to pick those gaps to focus on yet. That'll be later on. But let's just start identifying where am I now? What traits do I possess? What traits can I potentially improve um, to get to where I want to be in number one? Those, again, can be physical attributes. Maybe I need to get faster or maybe, maybe I'm already fast. Maybe people have told me that I'm really quick. Uh, maybe I'm really good at, at understanding um, the tactical side of the game and the strategy, right? Number three is how much time do I have until my season? So I mentioned before, if you have six weeks versus six months, that's gonna determine how much you can really focus on and improve, right, during your, during your development cycle. And so understanding what restrictions you have from a timeline standpoint is really important. And again, we don't need to think about yet, we don't need to think about how we're going to use that time yet, but we just need to understand how much time do we realistically have. And then also kind of have a, a caveat understanding that that timeline could change, but we're going to plan for whatever information we have available right now, we're going to plan for a best guess at this point. Number four, what will my training environment be like? This is especially applicable right now when a lot of people are remote. What space do I have and what equipment do I have? Okay, space and equipment are going to be the two kind of key variables that help influence your program design uh, probably most directly. Okay, so it's not, it's probably unlikely that a large majority of the athletes that you oversee or work with have a home gym set up like this. That's definitely gonna be an outlier. And if they do, I'm, if they have this, then I'm super jealous and um, good for them. They have no excuses. But they might be working with something like this. This is actually a picture that I took of my home gym right now. I carry this in the back of my truck and I can set up at the park when I go on and go lift some weights. This is all I, all I have. <laughs> and uh, I'm based in Seattle, Washington in the US. So in the Pacific Northwest, I probably only have one more month of nice weather where I can continue to use this. So if I'm planning my development cycle, I have to keep that into account. After a month from now, I might not have an ability to to train for all out strength unless things change for me or unless I buy some equipment and set up in my garage. So um, that's important to understand. My even, and, and probably in most cases, athletes probably have even less equipment than this. And I'm definitely not advocating that you tell your athletes to go jerry rig some equipment at Home Depot. That's, that's not what I'm promoting here, but just trying to set the reality. Um, in most cases, hopefully, Athletes will have access to some space, but depending, again, depending where you are geographically, winter can be pretty harsh and you might not be able to get out onto a field or a track during the winter. So that's something to consider as well. Understanding your training environment and how that's going to change during your development cycle is gonna be key. Once I have an idea of what I have and will have, then I can start to figure out, okay, how can I improve that? Am I going to be able to maybe save up and buy some equipment off of some used equipment off of, you know, eBay or Facebook marketplace or offer up or some other sort of resale website. Um, while the weather is still nice. Can I go to garage sales if that's allowed. Uh, if the local gyms are closed. Will they loan me some equipment. Right. Um, in some cases, can I make my own again. I don't want to I don't want to promote that heavily because we need to make sure we maintain some safety. But if you are limited with your equipment, you, you have some options. And these are some options that a lot of coaches have taken advantage of. So how, how can I improve my training environment, expand the options I have for training? Number six, how much time can I dedicate to training? Now, this is talking more about your weekly schedule or your monthly schedule, not like long term, how much time do we have, but how much, how much of my schedule can I dedicate to training? And I'll talk uh, later on about keeping it real. This is super important. There's a difference between saying how much would I like to train and how much can I actually dedicate consistently to training. Sure, is it great if I exercise six to seven times a week for myself? Yes, that's great for me and my lifestyle. That would be awesome. I'd be super healthy if I was doing that, most likely. Am I, likely to, am, am I super likely to exercise every single day of the week? Probably not. Especially right now, I'm super busy with work. There's gonna be times where your athletes are more busy with schoolwork. So, Maybe three, maybe three times per week is more attainable, maybe four or five. But understanding how much time we can actually dedicate in our schedule is also going to determine how we set up our development plan and our program design. 
again, right now we're still just trying to lay out all the variables, think about all the variables. And now if you've gone through this exercise and kind of answered them at some point, you're going to have uh, a pretty decent bank of information to help guide future decisions. Number seven, what am I going to improve? We've figured out what, uh, we've figured out what areas we want. Uh, we figured out what we want it to look like when we get to our season. We figured out the gaps between um, where we are now and where we want to be. We've already thought a little bit about the restrictions based on the equipment and the setting and the time. So now we start to look at all those things that we can improve, all those gaps that we've identified. Maybe we've crossed some of them out saying, hey, I need to improve strength, but I don't have access to equipment. So I probably am not gonna be able to improve that very much, but I can improve speed. That was one of the things I wanted to improve. So now we're gonna circle speed. Right now we can start to really hone in on a focus for our development cycle and start to aim our efforts towards something. Then we can build our actual training plan. This is gonna take the most amount of time for most people. Um, I definitely wouldn't expect your athletes, no matter, you know, no matter what their age group, to be able to build all of this stuff on their own. Their training plan is gonna take expertise. Right? And, th and this, this is gonna take more time. If, if uh, you are a coach and, and you have a background within strength and conditioning, you can help your athletes develop a plan. And we're gonna talk about that. If you're just an athlete who needs, needs some guidance, Volt's an awesome resource. You can go to the app store, download it, and it's like you get a free trial. And I'm, it's been a while since I've looked at our pricing, but I think for an individual, it's like 10 or 15 bucks a month, something like that. Um, there's also team pricing, and our team pricing is really affordable, um, sometimes 10 to $15 an entire year per kid on your team. And that's about all the pricing talking that I'm going to do uh, for this presentation. But it's really important to, to have a plan, to build a plan. This plan here, this is a snapshot from our coaching platform. Based on the dates of, uh, of this timeline, we've built out a periodized schedule with different training focuses um, and different blocks of, uh, of emphasis to take an athlete from where they are now, starting in a foundation block, very rudimentary movement, uh, very much like body weight movement focus to kind of get them rolling back into things going into some lean muscle mass development, strength, and then power as you get closer to your season. This is all super important to plan out. You need to have a progressive plan that develops athletes based on the timeline that they need. And once we have that plan, let's try and figure out what obstacles are gonna stand in our way. We talked a little bit about weather. You know, am I not gonna be able to do my sprinting during the off season because it's gonna be snowing out? Um, am I going to have times in the year where my, my workload at school is going to increase? So I'm going to have less time to train uh, for my sport. Are there going to be social events? My, my friends are going to want my time. I'm going to have to say no to some social events. And, you know, are there going to be other influences like parties that are going to get in the way? Am I going to want to play video games with my friends? That's something that's going to be really big right now in a remote setting too, is video games are a huge way for, for young athletes to socialize right now. And that might be the extent of their social interaction. So are video games bad? No, but they must be balanced. And you must be able to make decisions on where you're going to compromise or if you're going to compromise based on the other factors of your life that compete for your time. And so the last question is, how will I overcome these obstacles? And so if we've identified what our likely obstacles are, let's make sure we think through strategies for when those come up, how are we gonna deal with them? The advance of these 10 questions, you're going to have a really good idea of how to, how to be successful in your development cycle. You're going to have contingencies for obstacles that come up. You're going to have some flexibility based on the restrictions that come up later on. And you're going to have a, a, a lot clearer direction, even if your timeline is a little bit ambiguous. Um, again, this can be applied for COVID-19. This can be applied at any point during, um, during a development or during an athlete's pursuit of excellence or development. Moving on to the next section here, talking about expectation, expectation setting. This is one of the most valuable things that you can do as a coach to help set your athletes up for success. Right now, the, uh, the outlook is pretty dark for a lot of our athletes. I mean, it's, it's dark for everybody in a lot of ways, right? Very uncertain, something that we, most of us have never encountered a pandemic in our lives, okay? And, and people who are watching this, likely you might be older than me, right? Um, but our athletes are significantly younger and they've had significantly less exposures to dark, challenging, uncertain times. 
coaches have have in their lives because just because they've been around this planet for longer have other frameworks that they've developed in other uncertain times that they can apply to this specific scenario and use to cope but our athletes don't have that they're going to be relying on they're still trying to figure out who they are socially they're still trying to figure out you know they're not saving for retirement they're they're trying to get enough money to to spend on the weekends um to upgrade to the new video game that's coming out on, on xbox or whatever and so their problems are a lot different and they're relying on parents athletes coaches or parents and coaches to help determine what's a good path forward and so we need to make sure that we're, we're sympathizing with that we're not putting too much on them because they're trying to figure out so much else um, when we start to figure out when we start to think about okay what are we going to ask our athletes to do let's be conservative with that let's be uh, let's aim for i would even say aiming for a lowest common denominator is a great strategy at the beginning i'm going to kind of lay out some training scenarios for us and talk through the pros and cons of each I'm not going to make any recommendations, but I want us to all kind of think through what this might look like. Um, pretty common for football teams to train to strength train in the weight room three or four times a week during the off season, right? It's probably a pretty common clip when it comes to uh, frequency. So in this remote setting, I would encourage you to maybe consider pulling back a little bit and asking for a little bit less since so many things are so hectic and chaotic right now. And I'll explain why. Let's look at this three days per week schedule. In the first three weeks of training, let's say this is kind of like a pie in the sky, best case scenario. Athletes go three out of three, three out of three, three out of three for the first three workouts. So the first, first three weeks of their training plan. They get nine workouts done, they have 100% accountability, and they've got a nine workout streak going. Okay, that's a, that's a pretty good scenario to be in. Highly motivated because they've got a really good accountability and they have a lot of momentum with this workout streak and they've got nine workouts under their belt, okay? Again, this is probably one of our best case scenarios. Let's say we go four days per week, and they start out the first week going four for four. Awesome. The, the second and third week, they go three workouts just like before, but they're only able to get three out of the four workouts. After those three weeks, they've completed 10 workouts, so just one more workout than they would have if, uh, than, than in this scenario A. And now their accountability is an 83. So basically a low B average for, um, lower end B average for their accountability. And they just have a three workout streak going after these three weeks. So again, this is still a really good scenario. 10 workouts completed, over 80% accountability. I'd be pretty happy with this. Um, Dave, let's, let's look at a little bit, little bit less successful scenario. Again, four days per week. You start out hot with four out of four, and then you reduce to two the next week and two the third week. Now, we still only have one less workout, so eight in, in comparison to nine, but now our accountability is down to a, a D average, and we only have a two workout streak going. Um, this is, even though we've just, we've only done one less workout, not gonna make a huge difference in the grand scheme, scheme of things. The accountability and the smaller streak is, can be a little bit more of a demotivator, right? And then this is just a hybrid model. I've definitely seen this from coaches too, if, if they want to be a little bit more customized. Start week one. I'm, I'm, as a coach, I'm going to say, all right, we're going to do two workouts this week. Prove to me that you can execute two workouts, that you can fit two workouts into your weekly schedule. Perfect. We execute that. Now I'm going to add a third day. Okay, awesome. We did three out of three again. Now I'm going to add a fourth day. Okay, we were only able to do three out of four. Let's stick with three again. But after this three weeks, we have eight workouts again. Not too bad because in our, in our pie in the sky scenario, we did nine. We've got high accountability and a three workout streak going. So just kind of thinking about, okay, it's great if we are ambitious and say, okay, we're going to do four days a week of training. But even with, even with like 70% accountability almost, that can create some uh, demotivation if they're not able to check all the boxes versus, you know, maybe starting with a little bit more bite-sized, more, more approachable um, target could be a motivator in the long run and build some momentum. Ultimately, your expectations that you set with your athletes are only going to be impactful if they are communicated clearly, they're reasonable, so athletes can say, yeah, I agree with that or that makes sense, um, and if you enforce them. And, and I think that third one is something that we really want to, I, I, we really emphasize with a lot of our coaches. Again, you can set high expectations, but if those are never upheld. We've all been in a weight room probably in the past. We're like, okay, day one weight room orientation. Here's all the rules. You put equipment away, you spot people, 
right? You rest between, you know, while you're, uh, while you're resting between sets, you're doing some mobility or whatever it might be. And then by the second week, you've got weights everywhere, athletes aren't spotting each other. And that's all a result of not enforcing those expectations. Additionally, um, it's gonna be pretty tough for you to continue to enforce expectations if you're setting them too high, right? If you're saying, all right, we're running out four days of training per week, but only a third of your team actually does that, what are you gonna do with the other two thirds? Are you gonna punish them? I mean, their, their football season's already been delayed or canceled. So again, we, we need to make sure that we're setting ourselves up to be successful in helping our athletes achieve these expectations. Um, because ultimately these goals, if, if your athletes don't find it meaningful, then they're just goals that are important to you as the coach and not to the team. So hopefully, hopefully we can have a good sense of our team and what we're capable of doing. Start small, stack up those wins for your athletes so you can continue to help motivate them to achieve more in the long term. Um, and my last piece of advice when it comes to helping your team, uh, helping set your team up for success, this is a piece of advice that we share with our coaches, whether you're in a remote setting or not is picking a time and a place, specifying a time and a place for your athletes. Because even without COVID, even when people are on campus, some people have weight room time built into their class schedule. <laughs> That's great for them. I definitely didn't have that in high school. That would have been really nice. Uh, it'd be really nice as a coach if you had football class, right? but that's not the case everywhere. Sometimes you have to figure out before school or after school or maybe a blend of the two. But if you think about it, your athletes, from the time they step on the bus or arrive at school to the time they get back home from school or from practice, in a normal setting, their day is pretty much planned out for them. They don't need to think about how they're gonna shuffle their different tasks throughout the day because their schedule is pretty much set. Now we're asking them to set their own schedules in a way unless we help them by setting up some structure and by setting up that time in a place, even though it's going to be tough for you to, you know, you're probably not going to set a time in a place that works for everybody. You can try and find again, the lowest uh, common denominator, picking a time in a place, maybe working with outliers one-to-one -to, -one to figure out a time to keep them accountable and um, set the expectation that, Hey, this is something we're going to do as a team at this time. If you can't make it, we'll work something else out. That's going to be super helpful for, uh, helping athletes actually execute on their training. All right, uh, quick time check. Perfect, we're doing pretty well. We're gonna switch over to the actual at-home training design. And <laughs> the best way to focus your efforts and, and have a good return is to focus on what you can do. Focus on what you can do, what, you are able, what ac equipment you have access to, what space you have access to, a lot of this stuff I'm kind of repeating for emphasis, but focus on what you can do. And also that's a message that you can share with your athletes um, because there is a lot that they can't. But if we focus on what we can do, we control, we can control, and we can stack up the small wins. Again, I can't emphasize that more um, as a motivation tool, as a consistency tool. Focus on what you can do when you, start, when you sit down and start to plan your training design. If you have weights, then you can focus on getting stronger. Right, you can focus on getting stronger. You can, if you have a way to externally load the system, you can focus on uh, power development, lean muscle mass development. You can do all the things like work capacity as well. But having access to a way to externally load the system affords you the opportunity to train to get stronger. If you have space, then you can get faster. You can sprint. If you have 60 yards of sprinting space, that's pretty much that's mostly all you need if you're trying to train a football athlete to get stronger or get faster. Uh, sprinting distances outside of that are pretty, uh, pretty far and few between. And the bulk of our work is going to be spent within those shorter distances. So if you have 60 yards to sprint, um, that's going to open up a lot of options for you with your program design and you can get your athletes faster if that's something that they need to do. If you don't have weights or space, if athletes are going to be confined to their living room, uh, if they're confined to a small, like literally a yoga mat space, think about a yoga mat space they can still improve work capacity. They can still improve muscular endurance and stamina using circuit training, okay? And again, all of these things you can do within Volt very easily, but you don't need Volt necessarily to still be able to create a plan, right? Based on your background. These are, no matter your situation, we can still focus on certain things to improve and set, set our sights on specific targets. 
things that you, things that your athletes can always improve. Mobility, and mobility is not just stretching, right? No, mobility is not just having passive ranges of motion, but being able to have control and active ranges of motion. So getting into these, you know, I can lift my arm overhead, but what can I do here? I need to catch a ball overhead. Can I actually catch that? Can I break a fall if I have an uh, out, outstretched arm? Am I able to stabilize myself? Same thing with my hips. Mobility is having active control in those full ranges of motions. And that's something we can do regardless of what equipment we have. We can always focus on improving our nutrition and our hydration. Game changer that we'll talk a little bit more about nutrition and sleep hygiene later on, but sleep is another thing. We can improve our sleep habits. Mental skills, sports psychology, these are areas that we can improve as well. Uh, overall stress management and lifestyle, incorporating mindfulness. Uh, these are all opportunities that we have to improve in our living room. And then overarching, we can improve consistency, sticking, creating a plan and sticking to it, right? Developing high performance habits. These are always things that we can improve that are always within our control. So when we talk about training desi design, I'm going to talk about like the thought process that our Volt coaches go, go through as they're setting up their plan for remote training. So the simple design here is, um, is the first scenario that I'm going to go through. So with your team, whether you use a, a poll or a Google Sheet or whatever, just ask binary, yes or no. Divide your athletes into those who have equipment and those who do not. Okay, so they, now you're going to have two lists of athletes. Then you can create two programs. Obviously, if somebody doesn't have any equipment, they're going to be on a body weight training program. If somebody does say that they have equipment, then maybe you can put them on a, a, a regular football program that utilizes dumbbells and maybe barbells and whatnot. That, those are things that you can do very easily within Volt. It takes two minutes to set up. Okay? For those athletes who have equipment, because that can mean a multiple, multitude of things, if you have equipment within Volt, those athletes can just go into their settings and just tell Volt what equipment they have access to and what they don't have access to, and Volt will make those adjustments. So if they don't have a barbell, but we're asking them to do barbell back squats, they indicate that on their settings, Volt will say, okay, instead of barbell back squats, we're going to have you do dumbbell front squats or dumbbell goblet squat or whatever it might be. Okay, so that stuff happens automatically. If you don't have Volt, you can then develop a program and give your athletes options. Maybe A option, A means equipment, B means no equipment, or A means barbell, B means dumbbell, and just have those contingencies in place to allow athletes to self-select. There is gonna be some level of adjustability that you'll need to maintain if you're building your own program and you want it to be applicable based on setting. So that's a simple, simple route. Yes or no with the programs, and then just create two programs. Uh, a little bit more complex here with our in intermediate approach. Find out who has equipment, who does not within each of those categories. Figure out who has space for sprinting, about 60 yards. So then you'll end up with about four different programs, some that have equipment, some that don't, some that incorporate a sprint development plan and sprinting, and some that do not. And now you can divide your team into four different programs and address more elements that are more specific based on what equipment they do or do not have access to. And then the more complex scenario here, uh, this is a little bit more Volt specific, but definitely something you might be able to do as well is, again, binary yes or no, no athletes go on a, a body weight program. And then yes, athletes, you can build position specific programs for QB, skill, big skill, lineman, kicker. Maybe you do a, a, inter, or a novice and then an advanced weightlifting program. A lot of different ways to, to, to cut the cake but, or to cut the pie. But um, this just, again, allows for a little bit more complex or more, a little bit more individualization uh, based on the needs and the capabilities of your athletes. All this stuff, again, is really easy within Bolt. We show you how to do it, and it takes about two minutes to create any one program. And then that just goes, that always creates an entire year of training. So it goes with your athletes throughout the entire year. And if your timeline changes, you can just go in real quick to Volt, switch your, your season dates, your season start date, season end date, and then we recalculate another year of training based on that new timeline. So it's really, really easy. No matter what you're doing from a program des uh, design standpoint, no matter what, how complex you're making it or how simple you're making it, these are three principles to help guide your program and ensure safe training. If you are a strength coach, then you're definitely going to be familiar with these. Uh, progressive overload concept we'll talk a little bit about later in the return to play section. Uh, emphasizing rest and recovery. Again, we'll touch on that later as well. And then simple to complex. This is basically just saying, 
when you are selecting exercises, when you're selecting movements, as we like to call them, you have a progression of difficulty built in. You're not just throwing athletes into back squats right away because they need to learn that. Even if they're, if they're experienced in the weight room, they're coming off of a period of, uh, of extended inactivity. We need to make sure that we go and master the basics before we throw them into complex movements like back squats and hang cleans. So an example might be for your, for your squat progression, you might do bodyweight squat, dumbbell goblet squat, dumbbell front squat, and then maybe a back squat, maybe even do a barbell front squat before you go to a back squat, okay? Um, that's an example of how we go simple, simple exercise selection too complex over the long term to help set athletes up for success and execute specific movements uh, properly. All right, jumping into the return to sport section here. So again, we're talking about when athletes do return, there's an inherent risk of injury if they're not prepared. That's pretty logical and intuitive. And sports science really opens up some insight into how to manage that setting uh, appropriately. There's a, a quote here from our uh, head of sports science, Dr. Joe Eisenman, and you'll have to forgive me for reading directly from the slide, but I thought it was too good to, to try and summarize on my own. Um, he writes in a recent article, as athletes come back to the playing fields, gyms, and weight rooms, they are coming back in all shapes and different fitness levels. Some have transformed their bodies through internal motivation, support from their coaches and parents, and perhaps access to good equipment or creative resourcefulness of other implements, kind of like you saw uh, in, my, in my concrete gym, uh, to challenge the body. And yet others try to defy physiology and or ignore the concept of detraining and use, uh, the use it or lose it idea and are back to square one or potentially even minus square, run, square one. Okay, so there's, there's the reality check is that your athletes are going to come back in all different areas of fitness, levels of fitness. Some are going to be fine. Some are going to be the same. Some are going to be worse. And we need to account for that. A quick case study here. We can learn, we can take some learnings from um, situations in the past that share some similarities to the one we find ourselves in now. You've probably seen this, this has come up recently just because it's, it's topical, but the uh, 2011 NFL lockout season and um, this specific article will, this link will take you to an article in the Journal of Orthopedic Sports and Physical Therapy. In 2011, the NFL preseason was reduced from 14 weeks to 17 days due to a lockout. So essentially during that preparatory conditioning phase, what normally happens is that all athletes get access to their entire, pretty much their entire uh, sports medicine staff. So strength coaches, therapists, nutrition, all of this stuff, mental skills coaches and specialty coaches, 14 weeks leading up to the start of training camp. Um, a little bit different, that timeline is a little bit different now. I think it's maybe nine because the players union went back and forth. But anyways, that's what it was prior to 2011. Due to the lockout in the year of 2011, that was reduced from 14 weeks to just 17 days. So athletes were on their own up until 17 days from training camp. Um, and so a bunch of injuries occurred. From, uh, just to provide some context, from 1980 to 2001, NFL average of uh, Achilles tendon ruptures was about four or five per year. Again, from 1980 to 2001. In 2008, uh, and nine, and then 2010, 2011 season. So basically closer to that lockout season, uh, the NFL had six and 10 Achilles uh, ruptures per year, per respective year. Okay, so that's, that was happening across the entire year measured by, um, measured by the NFL. That year of the lockout, where the preseason was shortened significantly, there were 10 Achille uh, Achilles tendon injuries during the first 12 days of training camp because guys were not prepared. They had not had enough high, high stress exposures leading up to that training camp to allow them to actually participate at game speed or training speed without injuring themselves. Um, so it just goes to show, this just goes to show a kind of another uh, example that I'm gonna talk about here from, from sports science. It's gonna take time for your athletes to adapt to that level of performance that they need to, that they need to have that, level of work capacity that they need to have to be able to actually be safe and perform, uh, have high performance in their sport. The terms that Dr. Tim Gabbett and his team, uh, who's a sports scientist, he's actually based out of Australia, 
uh, use to kind of explain this, uh, explain this topic is the floor, the ceiling, and time. I'm going to try and get this quickly because because uh, we've got about 15 minutes left here. But the floor, the ceiling, and time. So in situation A here, the floor represents where an athlete is starting, where we're at at this point, okay? And the ceiling represents where they need to be to perform at a level that is that uh, ensures high performance and safety, injury mitigation, and in reduction of injury risk. So this might be six weeks, this timeline might be six weeks, whatever it is, there's a certain amount of time that it's gonna take to get your athlete from here to, from the floor to the ceiling. Now you can't rush, you just can't, you can't rush that timeline. There's no way that you can speed up time. It requires time, it requires a certain number of exposures of stress and a certain amount of time for recovery from that stress in order, in order to progress your athletes to where they need to go. You can't just get eight weeks of development squeezed into three. It just doesn't work that way. In fact, when we try to do that, we get a high spike in, uh, in workload, and that's when we expose our athletes to injuries. So what can we do, right? If, if uh, here's a scenario that we're gonna probably find a lot of ourselves in, a lot of our athletes in once they return to sport, their level of performance might even be lower than what they normally would be. They might be in the basement, okay, in the basement. And so what we're gonna have to do is kind of spread out this time. We're gonna have to afford ourselves more time to get to this, this level of performance. Um, so how can we do that? Well, we can maybe start our training earlier. We can maybe push back our target for, for high performance. So like if you're still gonna be starting your, if you're gonna start um, working with your athletes and you're gonna have four weeks before your season starts, well, your first game might be here and that means that you need to maybe reduce the number of plays that each, that, each, uh, that each athlete goes through during the game. You might need to spread that workout out, workload out, and then maybe two or three weeks later, then they can be at full capacity. Same with your practice plan, same with your conditioning plan, right? But the, the key takeaway here is you can't rush this timeline. You need to either start earlier, you need to delay the, the target a little bit, or the most effective method is to just rail your, raise raise your floor, okay? If athletes are able to start training now and maintain a high level, level of performance, then the space between your floor and your ceiling is reduced and there's less improvement that needs to happen in order to get your athletes to be, to be safe. High training workloads alone don't cause sports injuries. How you get there is the real issue. Again, it's, it's how you progress your athletes during that timeline. I mentioned before, if you, what, the, what this infographic kind of displays is that the greater change in workload, so if you're starting at zero here and then you introduce 5% more work the next week and then 10%, that's probably gonna be okay. Your, your, in, your risk of injury is only gonna be so much, but if you start to increase that significantly, the more drastic the spike in new workload, the higher risk of injury that you're going to expose your athletes to. So it's not necessarily exposure to high training workload, it's just how much you're doing within a certain amount of time. I think a lot of a lot of coaches and sports scientists have a disconnect because um, coaches might think that that sports scientists are against high like hard work hard <laughs> work, uh, and that's you know that could be due to a lack of communication skills on the part of the sports science, lack of understanding on the side of the coach. Really, that's it's that's not the case. It's not that that sports scientists are against hard work. It's just how much work you're doing, how much you're dosing your work within a given amount of time. So um, how, do we, how do we actually do this safely and effectively, right? This is a puzzle now. We need to figure out how to actually organize ourselves. Progressive overload is a concept that basically just talks about introducing incremental amounts of stress week by week or, or over time. So a quick refresher, progressive overload. This is my love Croton. This is basic strength conditioning 101. Um, Milo was a young boy. He was given a, a young calf. He walks his calf up the mountain every single day. Incrementally, that calf gets bigger. Incrementally, he gets stronger. By the time it's a bull, he's super jacked and strong. <laughs> and that's an oversimplification of how progressive overload works. Again, you just need to be able to introduce new and novel stresses in order to uh, improve your athlete's performance over time. You can't just do five by five until, until the end of time. You can't just do the same exor exercises until the end of time. You need to introduce new stressors, but you can't do random stuff. There's a, there's, a, there's a balance between new and novel and then allowing repeated exposures for development. 
So here's a little bit of a, here's a resource that can help you plan your um, return to play protocol, your practice design, your weight room design to keep athletes safe. So the rule here is that the principle is actually the 50, 30, 20, 10 rule. And this is something set forth by the CSCCA, which is the Collegiate Strength and Conditioning Association and the NSCA, which is the National Strength and Conditioning Association, the national governing bodies for strength and conditioning within the United States. Um, we're going to focus here on this, uh, on this third column here, talking about return from injury. So this is uh, exertional heat injury or um, uh, exertional rhabdomyolysis. So key air injuries that often occur when, at, when, well, actually specifically speaking to football because they usually start in the summer um, when athletes get injured from heat illness or whatever it is, or overexposures to training or after a long period of inactivity. So here's, how, here's what, what the national governing bodies are um, recommending for coaches, for practice design, for conditioning design, for strength, for strength training design. Week one, if you have five weeks here, week one, you're gonna reduce how much work you would normally do. You're gonna reduce the exposure by 50%. 50 then you're gonna introduce 30% more and you're gonna to go to 70%. Uh, sorry, then you're gonna only reduce um, to 70%. So 30% less than what you would normally do. 70% in week two. Week three is 80%. And then week four is 90%. And then you can get to 100%. Now, again, these are just guidelines. You don't need to stick to these specifically. But the takeaway message is this. We are incrementally increasing. We are incrementally increasing workload. We're starting at a reduced level from what we would normally do. And we're gradually increasing from there. Nobody's going to benefit from doing your crazy conditioning test in week one to see who actually kept themselves themselves in shape. You as a coach, honestly, you should be able to know that from your practices, watching practice, you should be able to determine who is out of shape and who is in shape. You don't need a conditioning test to determine that. Okay. And a lot of times that conditioning test test is just going to be uh, a dangerous risk. So try and pull back with your practice design and gradually increase as you can. 30, 20 or 50, 30, 20, 10 is a great kind of guideline framework to go to go on. And then you can use your coaching sense, your coaching eye to modify that as needed. Okay. Uh, rest and recovery. Okay. So it's important to understand rest and recovery is just as important to actual training, right? You actually get stronger and you actually adapt once you are recovering from your training stress. So if we're right here, if this is our baseline performance level, this is me standing here in front of you giving this talk, this is how I can perform right now. If I were to go work out right after this, I'd introduce a training stressor, I'd be in a decreased uh, level of performance for a little bit, and then I would eventually adapt with adequate recovery, and I'd be at a higher level of performance. This is the general adaptation syndrome as it, per, uh, as it pertains to strength and conditioning. Okay, we need to understand that recovery is important. We can't just introduce another stressor before athletes, uh, before athletes recover, because then they just dip into this overtrained state, decrease performance, increase risk of injury. Nobody's getting better there. Athletes are getting hurt right there. So we need to make sure that we're managing rest and recovery appropriately. Nutrition and sleep are cornerstones of recovery. They play a huge role. Um, and nutrition is a topic that I, you know, we could spend a ton of time diving into. And honestly, a registered dietitian would be much more equipped to give you that sort of information. So um, here are a couple resources that, you, that we've linked to for credible information about nutrition and, uh, and, and diet for our athletes. Just some key practical nutrition guidance, things that you can pass on to your athletes. It's best to shop around the perimeter um, of the grocery store for real whole foods. Most of the stuff in the middle is, is more, so pro, more so likely to be processed. So stick to the outside of the grocery store. It's gonna be a good, a good habit to get into. Um, another habit is keeping snacks with you and fueling, uh, fueling your tank before and after, filling your tank before and after practices and paying attention to your hydration levels. We know that light colored pee is usually better. Dark colored pee is usually worse. It means you need to hydrate. So um, those are easy, easy things that you can control and that you can start to implement within your, your daily life as an athlete. At no time in the day are you recovering better than when you are sleeping, hopefully. Hopefully that's the case. And not only do we need to focus on how much sleep we get, but we need to focus on the quality of that sleep to really maximize uh, the work that we're doing when we're not sleeping. So ways to do that, 
Your body, body really likes rhythms. So try and get into a consistent sleep and wake schedule so your body can be more predictable for when it needs to go to bed and when it needs to wake up. Signal your body into bedtime mode with a power down routine. Again, talking to the rhythms, just like you might have a pregame routine to get yourself into the right state of mind, hype your body up a little bit. We do a warm up before we lift. We need to prime, prime our body and our nervous system to perform. Same thing with when we want to uh, power down. It works in the same way. Setting up a sleep cave in your bedroom that optimizes for, for dark, for quiet, um, having a cool temperature. The body like, actually likes to be cooler and it cools down once it goes to sleep. So setting yourself up that way is gonna be a way to improve that sleep quality. Uh, this is a big one for our athletes is reducing the amount of scrolling that we do before bed. It's gonna be tough, but if you can stay off of social media before you go to bed, that's gonna <laughs> improve your sleep, probably improve your mental health because you're not worrying about anything uh, before you go to bed. Or, or, or that's just one less thing you're worrying about before you go to bed. And then of course, Caffeine is for waking up. Avoid using caffeine before going to bed. I like to cap my caffeine intake at like 2 or 3 p.m. because I know if I go any later than that, it's going to affect how, how easily I can fall asleep. So really easy takeaways there. So the third component here of return to sport um, I'm going to talk about is individualization. So thinking about individualization for your athletes from a programming and from a response standpoint. We mentioned before, your athletes are going to be in different states of, of performance, different states of fitness when they return. So if we just give everybody the same program, we're going to run into some big time challenges. So we're responsible for pulling back when we need to, to account for, diff for those differences. So ideas for, for the programming element of individualization. Um, program design with novice and advanced movement alternatives. Again, within Volt, you can create level one programs for more novice, level two programs for more advanced, you might just end up creating different programs based on, um, you know, freshmen versus seniors or frost versus upper class and whatever it might be. You can set up different movement progressions to account for their proficiency in weightlifting skill. Um, another way to individualize program design is to load athletes based on rating of perceived exertion. So instead of having to prescribe based on what one rep max is, you can say, and, and this sounds too simple, be, simple to be true, but it's backed by research. It is practically viable to say, okay, I want you for your sets of back squat or your, your sets of um, lunges today, I want you to do four sets with uh, 10 reps at a difficulty of seven out of 10, right? And that's a way to program that becomes relative to each individual versus going strictly off of percentages with estimated one rep maxes. Um, you can also provide choices for pre-workout primers or finishers. So you give athletes a little bit of autonomy. Again, this is probably for your more advanced athletes, maybe later on in your training plan. But if you can allow them to say, okay, between your warm up and between your workout, you can choose to do a mini circuit. If you need to do some ACL injury prep, or you need to do some hip mobility, or you need to open up your, you know, you need to do some thoracic spine mobility, go ahead. The next five minutes are yours to do this circuit that we've laid out for you. That's a great way to individualize and let athletes self-select and give them some autonomy and, and help generate some buy-in in that way. Monitoring, so this, now we're talking about the response. Monitoring is gonna be super helpful as well. In Volt, we do a readiness questionnaire. Every time somebody opens up a workout, we ask them to rate their soreness, stress, energy, mood, and sleep. As a coach, if you're tracking that over time, you can see when things are starting, if, if things start to trend downwards, it might mean that there's something that needs to be adjusted with your program design. So that's an awesome way to get a pulse of how well your team is handling your training. Um, Post-workout session RPEs are another, uh, is, is another way to monitor that. So all that is is after your workout, asking your athletes, okay, rate, rate that workout difficulty on a scale of one to 10. Uh, we don't do that in Volt, but it's something that we're, we're working on and it's something that can be really effective. Again, just subjective ratings of difficulty and if you wanted that training session to be like maybe a, a five or a six for most of, you, most of your athletes, but they were all rating it as a seven or eight, that means that something's off and you can track that and you can have an intervention and you can understand that um, this is the actual response that your athletes are having to the training that you're building out for them. And the last thing here is just your, your coaching eye, your coaching sense. Is what you're doing in the weight room taking away from what you're doing on the field? Do you need to pull back uh, in any area? Are we giving our athletes too much work? 
Or can we, can we maybe push them a little bit more? Can we have them work a little bit harder? Because they still seem really fresh at the end of their practices or at the end of their weightlifting, session, weightlifting sessions. Those are all ways to monitor the, the response to training. And again, it's going to vary by athlete, but if you're tracking any of, that, any of those things, it might, bring, it might give you some flags and areas to focus on. Uh, and Jamie, I promise I'm almost done. We're at the hour, but I'm almost done here. Um, actually, I am done. That was, that was slide 53. I'm at slide 54. So <laughs> that, was, that was better timing than I was expecting. But uh, hopefully, hopefully it was helpful. Oh, seriously. Great, great presentation. Very informative. I learned so much through this. I was just like eyes glued <laughs> the whole time. I know you couldn't see my video, but uh, seriously, Bo, thank you so much. And for anybody watching this, go check out Bolt Athletics. Seriously, I've used it for a while now. I like to compare it to basically, you have a personal training coach with you in your pocket and it's way cheaper. It's, it's seriously a great, great platform. Our national team players use it. Uh, it's, it's, it's incredible, especially for at-home workouts. Like I can, I can adjust it all to, to what I have, what my goals are and everything. It's so responsive to you as an athlete and as a person. Uh, it's, it's just incredible. And everything else, you know, uh, that you touched on that's just outside of actually working on your body and working on your mind and working on your habits, working on your goals is all super important to your success as an athlete and your success in what you want to achieve physically. And yeah. so, yeah, you touching on that, you really hit the nail on the head. Bo, I really appreciate you coming out and really appreciate everyone else for watching this. And thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, I have my contact info here, so please feel free to reach out. If you are interested in purchasing Bolt, purchasing Bolt, you can still reach out to me. I, just to set the expectation, right? Setting expectations, I will pass you on to one of my teammates because I don't deal with pricing or anything like that. Um, but I will likely be working with you uh, or one of my team members will be working with you if you decide to use Bolt. So um, feel free to reach out. I can help put you in the right direction or you can just go straight to our website, voltathletics.com to learn more.